Hi, I'm Sarah Backhouse for Hub Culture. I'm joined by David Franson, Consul General for Canada. Welcome, David. Good to be here. Yeah, how have you enjoyed the conference so far? Uh, very much. Uh, for me, this is the third, I've been at all three summits, so uh, it's good to see the progress that's been uh, achieved. Now, you hosted a VIP dinner last night. Uh, what, was the, what was the idea behind that? Well, uh, I represent the Government of Canada in uh, Southern California, and uh, our objective uh, is to, one of our objectives is always to create opportunities for uh, Canadians to meet with counterparts from California and other countries. This conference, bringing together as it does uh, like-minded people from around the world, it's a perfect opportunity to, to do that. So the dinner last night, we, we brought together people like Premier Campbell from British Columbia, Secretary Lynn Adams, Mary Nichols of CARB, International uh, Energy Agency Director, Deputy Director Richard Jones. So you know you bring together different people and uh, you have a chance to, again, in a more intimate, uh, less formal setting, talk about the issues. Now you work at a state level, so you would know and be able to glean how uh, effective sub-national governments are in combating climate change. Indeed. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, to represent the Government of Canada in California is a particular privilege, uh, because California itself has played such an extraordinary role in uh, efforts to combat climate change. It has been that way for many, many years. Uh, so f for me to be here is another opportunity in a series of opportunities to uh, continue to learn from those people who have taken the lead. Uh, California EPA and CARB have been extraordinary leaders uh, on all fronts and I think the governor's uh, AB 32 is perhaps the crowning achievement. I mean, It's the, the one piece of legislation anywhere in the world that, it, that looks at the issues related to climate change in a comprehensive way lays out a framework and then empowers an organization, a regulatory authority, to go out and develop regulations and implement those regulations. It's extraordinary. Mm. So to be here and to see that in action as, as a government and as an agency actually try to do that uh, is a pretty rare uh, opportunity. How do you feel about Schwarzenegger's imminent departure? <laughs> Uh, I think the governor has uh, has been an extraordinary leader on the climate change front. Uh, I think he he's clearly staked out an area where he wants to make a mark and where he has made a mark. And I think the the fight over Prop 23 mm. uh, again sort of demonstrated the the way in which there is a particularly strong feeling about the need to, to address climate change. And what about Canada's role in fighting climate change? Is it significantly different from the stance that America takes? Uh, actually, it's significantly similar. <laughs> the, uh, the Government of Canada has uh, adopted an approach to the international negotiations which seeks to, to move the yardsticks forward but in a way that is very well aligned with the United States. And the reason for that is, is fairly obvious. Uh, our economy is very uh, significantly affected by what goes on in the U.S. economy. And for us to take a position that would be at variance with that in any dramatic way would, would have some pretty dramatic uh, impacts in Canada. So we've tried to move at the national and international level in accord with what goes on uh, at, uh, in, in Washington. That said, um, we also have provinces like the U.S. has states. And those provinces vary in their own degrees of kind of aggressive behavior vis-a-vis -vis climate change. And that's something that we welcome. So tell me about some of the Canadian provinces and how they're dealing with climate change. Uh, well, a number have taken uh, very active measures uh, and, and always within the context of, of, the, of the nature of their economy and, you know, no surprise, uh, economies are regionally defined and they're dependent upon their natural resources and, and you know, the makeup of, of, of their regions. Uh, British Columbia has taken a, a very active uh, approach. It has a pretty comprehensive framework in place and measures across the board. Uh, the measure that's, that's probably best known is their carbon tax, and, you know, where they've actually put a price on carbon and they're taxing. And uh, uh, it's, it, that's unique in and of itself. There aren't many regimes that are doing that. Uh, and they've also, and the Premier has also made a commitment that it would be revenue neutral, so that the revenues that come from the carbon tax would then be returned to the population in a variety of ways. And he's made very heavy commitments on that front that, you know, have have resulted now over the course of a couple of years in rendering what was contentious at the outset to be pretty well accepted. 
And so it's, it's a really interesting example of how a subnational government takes the lead in something that at the national level tends to be really, really difficult to achieve. Ontario is another province that's taken a, a pretty interesting uh, move forward on it to address climate change. It's uh, put in place a feed-in tariff program. Uh, Ontario is a, a heavy manufacturing economy. Uh, the auto sector is tremendously important to Ontario, for example, but it it's, it's, has, has had a manufacturing presence across the board uh, that, like everywhere else, like California, for example, is threatened by the forces of globalization. So, you know, in, a, in an attempt to address that, it's put in place a series of measures that um, seek to transform the economy to one that is based much more on renewable energy. Uh, the feed-in tariff is one instrument of that, and again, there aren't many jurisdictions around the world that have put in place feed-in tariffs, uh, and it's, it's attracting a lot of attention, and, you know, they've got, uh, they've had significant impact, both in terms of the energy that's coming from this program, and also the jobs that they've created. They hope to establish, uh, they promise to create 50,000 jobs over three years. After year one, they've already created 18,000 jobs. Mm. So, you know, we've got interesting things going on across the board. Wonderful. Well, David Franzen, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.